And I'd rather tame a Mustang than inspire a mule. Never lose your fire. So we go out and we film this this show. We took boys right out of prison. Three different gangs represented. Assault with a deadly weapon. Attempted murder. Guys doing heroin at 15. Severe abuse. Yeah. All of them. No dads. Buena Vista, Colorado. And went to a ranch. 30 person crew. I'm the executive producer. And I'm the mentor for these boys. And I got chewed up and spit out. Was it just like a desire for significance? Was it a, des a desire for fame? The adrenaline? Like what it's was all it? Above. All of it. It was yeah. probably those two things. It was probably fame and significance. For me, I was very fearful huh. of uh, not being somebody. This thing is full on idol in my life. Vision she gets a vision. Chasing Wild, which is the name of the series. Yes. In a tomb. Yes. And you get a dream of it in a coffin. Yeah. Okay. I get a call from the producer. She goes, hey, I've been really hesitating to say this to you, but the last week the Lord's been telling me that Chasing Wild needs to die. Hey everybody, welcome to the Thematic Podcast. My name is Craig, and today my guest is the one and the only Ryan Miller. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm gonna introduce him in a second, but this is a series that we're doing called Conversations in Contrast. We're actually sitting right now in Shalom, the mobile podcast studio. We're touring from Seattle to San Diego, and we are in the San Diego area right now, and uh, I don't know, people will listen to this in a few months, probably Ryan, but we are <laughs> we are about to be hit Southern California with the first ever hurricane since like 1936 or something. <laughs> so we're trying to get this filming done before we jet on out of here and, and Lord protect your family and your home. But if you hear some background noise, there's like an RV over here with a loud engine and squeaking and everything. It's because we're literally in a trailer that we built into a podcast studio. What do you think of it? It's pretty sick. Oh, thank you. This is unbelievable. As a filmmaker, I yeah, appreciate yeah. that coming from you. <laughs> it's very, very impressive. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was saying you got to get some BTS. You got to like show them the kids Behind the that scenes. are right there. Yeah, <laughs> the kids are right there. Jessica's right here. It's so cool. And so what we're doing on this series, for anybody that's new to it, is we're inviting people, leaders, pastors, Christian influencers to pull back the curtain on pain a little bit. Uh, one of the unintentional side effects of social media is that people are looking at everybody else's life through filters. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to hashtag fight the filter and uh, and just talk about the struggle, the pain, the, the sometimes suffering, sometimes a dark night of the soul that God has used to make people to be used in his hand. And so I, I've found that the people that are doing great things for God typically aren't there because their life is just perfect, but because they've been through something. Mm. And so... That's what we felt compelled by God to do in this series, and that's why we've been traveling for the last 25 days, and uh, we're finishing up our tour here. You're one of the last, Ryan, and so it's an honor to have you with us. So um, the way that I'm introducing my guests, if it's okay with you, is every one of my guests is a, a person of great influence and, and probably could have a, a big curated bio. Uh, but I'm trying to introduce people from just the perspective of like, somebody's not reading somebody's whole bio just mm -hmm. in terms of like normal people looking at your life and so whether you know whatever all of my guests I've just been saying let me introduce you from the perspective of how somebody might view you from afar maybe a mm -hmm. social media follower maybe somebody in your congregation maybe somebody that's not like per se a close friend of yours so you and I've met a couple times so I do know you a little bit we're friends but I don't know like a ton about your life and mm -hmm. mainly I see you from afar we really met because of social media. So yeah. I'll just introduce you that way and trust that it would maybe, it would be about the way that some normal person might perceive you. And sure. then we'll talk about the reality. Sure. So I first uh, saw you, heard of you on, uh, through TikTok. You're posting, I think your account is called Dude With Good News, at least the one that I found, me and my wife found. And and uh, you're doing similar stuff that what I was doing, just sharing hope, sharing scripture, sharing little prayers, preaching the gospel online a couple minutes at a time. Mm -hmm. And so, and then we met later in person. Um, and I've come to find out that, man, you're like a great movie producer, movie, television shows. You got all that going on, which I don't know if people really even know about. And maybe we could talk about that today. Um, but... You're reaching millions of people. Mm. You live in Southern California. You've got an amazing wife, family, beautiful, everything. I mean, you've got this life that a lot of people might see from afar, maybe a younger generation and think, man, he's got it all going on. Like, he's got it all together. And <coughs> I could never, I don't know how I would ever be used by God like that. Like, he just has so much going on and he knows the scripture and he's, he's, 
posting all these videos and reaching people, there's an anointing on it. And so I guess my simple question to you is either everything in your life's just been easy and laid out and God's just sort of served it up on a silver platter to you, or you've been through some struggle. Mm -hmm. You've been through some hard things, some pain maybe. I don't know, maybe a dark night of the soul. And so if the latter is true, I want to ask you to whatever degree and whatever area you want to talk about, Mm. will you tell us about one of the hardest things that you've been through in your life and how God got you through? Yeah. Oh, gosh, I don't even know where to go. Um, I'll I'll start when I was a kid. So my family's very interesting. (laughs) Um, So I am the only person, I'll put it this way, I'm the only person in my generation of, say, almost 20 cousins and, you know, brothers and all that who does not have a PhD. What? I'm the only Christian. Well, you're um, the only Christian. I'm the only Christian. So you didn't grow up in church? I did grow up in church. My parents are saved. Your parents are saved? Yes, my parents are saved. Okay. My brother just got named top 40 scientist under 40 in the world. He's a neuroscientist. No. My other brother is a professor at the London School of Economics. He went from Stanford, Dartmouth, Michigan. What? Now he's a professor. Where did you grow up? San Diego. So I grew up here. You've always been here? Yep. Okay, how many brother, yeah. How many siblings do you have? Two older brothers. And they're both genius Genius. PhDs. Yes. Yes. But like my cousin is the, um, is like the top brain surgeon at the Mayo Clinic. <laughs> what? Like this is all, it's like next level. Jessica, take note if we ever need to go to the Mayo Clinic. Uh, honestly, I've sent, I've sent people. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, what? So, but it's, it's, it's all vanity. Like it's all, it's a, it's a, it's a bunch of very successful, unhappy people hmm. and a very unhappy people. Um, at least a lot of them. And so, but I grew up in this weird environment where um, my brother came out of the closet when I was a freshman in high school. I was five foot two, a buck 15, um, like Jufro <laughs> and like chubby. I don't even know how you're, uh, you know, 115 pounds, but chubby, <laughs> awkward. <laughs> but like my face was like fat and 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 uh, my brother came out of the closet. We looked like twins. So when he came out, it was like I came out. And so people thought I was gay. And it was the most intimate time of my life with Jesus was in high school. Really? Yeah. So I met the Lord early on. I started getting bullied. Um, I literally had people spit in my face, say, your brother's a effing, you know what, and so are you. And friends that would do this, you know, and then obviously we wouldn't be friends anymore. So this is not 2023. This is, you know, very homophobic high school environment, 2015 or 2005. And so, um, but I loved it because- What do you mean you loved it? I loved it because I had nothing. And like, Mm. it was like the Holy Spirit encountered me. Um, I've been obsessed with baseball my whole life. I got cut from the baseball team my freshman year, sophomore year, junior year, and then made it my senior year, but sat the bench. And what, but I'm like, I'm going to be a big league baseball player. Uh-huh. And I would just go on campus. I'd just start sharing the gospel with people. I'd go into random stores and start sharing the gospel with people because I had nothing. I, and like nothing that the world saw as valuable. Right. My home life's in shambles. My brother's getting sent away to these, you know, like camps for troubled kids. Um, me and him would fist fight like almost weekly, like not like brother fist fight, like bloody nose. Uh, I'd be encouraged by my dad to fight him. And so very like, you know, about toxic masculinity. I hate that term. But this is what I grew up in, in a lot of ways. Wow. Um, so yeah, so that, that was my upbringing. So it, so all of this like pushed you to an actual deep relationship with the Lord at that age. Yeah. Because you had nothing else. So you were pressing into God. And I didn't know I had nothing else. That wasn't like a thought. It wasn't like, I don't have anything. But looking back now, I've now experienced the thorny soil where all these things can choke out the word of God and, mm-hmm. and, and his intimacy in your life. And so now I see, I'm like, wow, like that was fertile soil for Mm -hmm. me to be really, really deep with Jesus. Um, And then I went to college and I I like grew and like girls started finding me attractive for the first time in my life. (laughs) And I got good at at like school too. Like Mm -hmm. I I kind of like went away from like my brother's academia and all that stuff. I'm like, not really for me. So went to Wheaton College, Christian school in Illinois, Mm -hmm. Um, try out for the baseball team, make the baseball team, start on the baseball team 
all conference, all region, wow. freshman of the year. Wow. I go, I'm playing, you know. It's like a Michael Jordan story, cut, 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 big time. Kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Without the gambling yeah, and without the, without, without making it all the way Without to the making it yeah, all yeah. the way. Um, <laughs> and, and then, yeah, I, I had everything. I went from in one year being like kind of like this. Um, I w- it wasn't like I was like a nerd or like an outcast. I just was kind of like a nobody. And then all of a sudden I, I'm just good at stuff. And so I'm going, I'm playing in the top summer baseball leagues with guys like Aaron Judge and Patrick Wisdom. And like, huh. it, it just switched. I'm like now with a lot of guys I watch in the big leagues. Wow. And then um, in college, I, you know, started dating this really attractive girl who ended up cheating on me. And just like this whole thing started, like the thorny soil came and just choked it out. Mm-hmm. I'm at this Christian school and I'm like, I don't, I don't know Jesus like I did when I was like driving people to the parties when I'm a sophomore in high school, you know, and wow. just kind of this nerdy kid that you know had nothing going for him and so I think um that was my first lesson in meekness in understanding that the good things of this life are to walk with Jesus intimately Hmm. you know we were just talking about Job and and Solomon and how they have completely different experiences on one hand Job loses everything on the other hand Solomon gains everything and they both get to the end of these stories and they say the same exact thing that the only thing valuable in this life is to know God to do what he says and to walk with him right that's it and so that's what I, I started learning even after college. And I, I, I did get a chance to play minor league baseball. And um, it was all empty. It's all vanity. It's like it's just such a sham. You know, you get to like these places where you want to go. As you and I both know, like the follower counts where people probably look at it and they're like, oh, my gosh, like that must be so nice to like reach all these people. And like, yeah, there's a little bit of dopamine that hits when a video goes viral or something, but it goes away. And like yeah. what's left is obedience to Christ. Right. And that's the good stuff. And so that's that's kind of where I had to get to. Um, and that certainly wasn't the end of my struggle journey. Um, the Lord has has kept me in that, um, in his graciousness and in his mercy. What but, do you mean kept you in that? Like what's that fe- what's that <clears throat> looked like and what's that felt like? So my like take us into because here's the here's the thing and, and I'll just say this. Like my one of the things my wife said about you and I was like, We're interviewing Ryan. She's like, oh, dude, with good news. <laughs> He's so smiley. Oh, cool. And uh, I know she wants me to smile a little bit more. Um, sometimes I have facial non-reflectitis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> My face doesn't always RBF. reflect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the other term. <laughs> My face doesn't always reflect uh, joy on the outside. You are a very smiley person. So Thanks, dude. you come off at least as joyful, confident, um, all those things. So like, what's what's this process been like? for you uh have you always been joyful are you joyful or is it yeah. something that's just you're working on the outside but you but it's different on the inside or like what what do you mean that the lord's taking you on a journey of <clears throat> meekness hmm. i'm extremely joyful and extremely confident but that had to that had to be fabricated at first okay um and i had to kind of burrow under a mountain for a while to get refined and hmm. so what i mean by that is i graduated college and now all of a sudden baseball ended um, I, w- I, I was watching these like 18 year old Dominicans come up and I'm like, they're so much better than me. Yeah. I'm not going anywhere. Okay. So like, I left and I went into ministry and then I tried to find that same, you know, your again, second choice, God's first choice. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that's kind of, that's good. <laughs> um, I, I didn't realize how much of an idol success and acclaim in baseball was for me okay and so ministry became my idol in my acclaim and success i wanted the stage i wanted to be christian famous if i'm being honest okay um about what age would you say that's right out of college 23 24 probably, yeah after baseball so i played a few years of minor league baseball oh, after yeah. college so about 25 okay um and so so yeah I, I went on staff at a church um very unhealthy church uh in a lot of different ways but then I, I eventually realized, like, I think in, in two ways. There was one unhealthy reason for doing this and one healthy reason for doing this. I started to see some things I didn't like with the church. And I don't mean, like, um, the, the global church. I mean the system of the local churches where I'm just like, oh, my gosh. Like, I'm having – I had a youth group of, like, 100 kids showing up, and they, like, half of them would be, you know, high or drunk and getting in fights and stuff. And I loved that. And the particular church I was at did not like me getting subpoenaed at staff meetings. And I'm like, I love this because I grew up wild. I grew up kind of this crazy kid trying to find my way as I've got this successful family. And, and I just became this prankster. I never, I never drank. I never was hooking up with girls. I was addicted to pornography pretty heavily. 
But um, so that was a big struggle for me as well. So when you say you love this, you mean you love that you're actually reaching yeah. broken people. It's the not, wild ones. Yeah. Yeah. The, the wild the, ones. The wild Mustangs, as I said. You know, I had a coach in, in high school after I would just be getting in fights. You know, I wasn't even on the team. I was in baseball PE. I'd be getting in fights. And the coach would pull me off the side of the field. And this one coach in particular, his name was Dom Johnson. He goes, Ryan, I thought I was going to get like – you, like sent home he's like ryan i'd rather tame a mustang than inspire a mule never lose your fire huh. and that to me was like yes that was my rally cry it's like no i'm not this crazy kid i'm not this you know little squirrely five foot two kid running around like no i'm this mustang and i can channel all that energy and all that passion and so that that to me was who i wanted to reach i wanted to go after the mustangs so i'd go on campus and i would just i would just stay after campus and i'd you know, me and my wife, we just bring ice cream to like the, I called it the gay goth group. It's exactly who they were. It was like the, the gay straight alliance club and they were, just, they were goths and we just go kick it with them, share the gospel. They get saved. <laughs> <laughs> just like go, go hang out with, with, um, just the, it's funny. You go on a high school campus after hours, the kids who are left there are the, the kids whose parents aren't picking them up right away. Mm -hmm. And so they're the ones who are needing that spiritual direction. So we would just go share the gospel and, mm -hmm. and God would do amazing things. And then mm -hmm. they, they'd come to youth group. Right. And then the church was like, uh, what do we, we do? What do we, it's very much like the Jesus revolution type yeah. stuff in that yeah. movie, you know? And so, um, eventually I got so disenfranchised that I was just like, I'm going to make a movie. I'm going to, and, and almost this holy discontent. I'm like, I'm going to take these, the most wild Mustangs I can find kids out of gangs, prison, foster care, addiction, the ones that the church would not want to touch. And I want to take them and actually literally have them tame and train wild Mustangs. And I'm just going to make a movie. And so <laughs> I quit my job. I started taking film classes. I emailed literally thousands of filmmakers and said, I'm going to make a movie about, you know, four boys taming four Mustangs. You emailed thousands. Literally, prob <laughs> probably close to 2,000 filmmakers. No. Yeah. So you weren't in film before that. I had no idea. I, I literally was emailing them saying, I'm an executive producer of this movie. I didn't even know what executive producer meant. <laughs> <laughs> it just sounded like the best title. So, so, and people responded. Well, a couple of people after about three months, nobody responded for about three months. Yeah. And then a couple of people responded an Emmy award winning or d director and Oscar award winning producer. And then the marketing uh, and distribution company from Frozen to Hunger Games came on board. And then off of their names, we were able to get, go raise a few million bucks to make it happen. <laughs> you <laughs> raised a few million, few million dollars. Not on my name, but off theirs. Yeah. So, and, and it was the Lord. The Lord was putting it all together. Yeah. <clears throat> and mind you, so my wife's family's rich. So I married into a rich family, which is, that has a whole other complexity and weirdness to it as well. Um, beautiful, a lot of beautiful stuff too, because they, they love Jesus. Um, but her grandpa is like this patriarch, started this big company. And he, he like would tell people, he's like, I write, I think Ryan's the next Billy Graham. And that for me, even, even like at that age where I idolized that, yeah. um, I knew there was something like, Ugh. I think the Holy spirit was like, we're, we're going to play this out. Like we're going to, that, that's going to need to get buried deep. Mm. And so what, what ended up happening was we go out and we film this, this show. We took boys right out of prison, like, you know, in Prisoned at uh, 16 years old in an adult prison for robbery, you wow. know, black kid in the South, um, just, you know, did solitary confinement for over nine months, like really gnarly wow. stuff. Kids doing heroin and crystal meth. We had three different gangs represented, um, assault with a deadly weapon, attempted murder, um, you know, guys doing heroin at 15. And so we're taking these kids, like severe abuse, yeah. all of them. No dads. No dads yeah, yeah. anywhere to be All found. brokenness. All brokenness. You take them where? Out in Wyoming so we went to or Colorado. something? Colorado. Colorado? Yeah, yeah. Um, Buena Vista, Colorado, and went to a ranch, and um, it was crazy. You know, like 30-person crew. I'm the executive producer, and I actually knew what that meant at that point, and I'm the mentor for these boys. And I got chewed up and spit out. Like, it was, it was bad. First of all, the arrogance of me thinking, you know, this white... Um, upper middle class dude uh, to be able to relate to what they're going through and be their mentor like just the sheer arrogance of that <laughs> is like almost comical <laughs> but again I want to be Christian famous and so I'm like I need to be the guy I want the camera mm. and now in hindsight I can look back and see all of it and it's all gross to me um, but it turned into an amazing film series so much so that you know it, it turned from a movie to a 14 part series at like 45 minutes of pop and we're going out to Hollywood now. We've got the top agency in Hollywood repping us. The vice president of Unscripted repping us at that agency. And uh, we're getting million dollar offers from, you know, MGM Studios and other studios. And it's like, 
everything I wanted. I'm like, I'm seeing it. Hmm. Like, I'm going to be that. They're going to, they're going to, honestly, my dream was for them to look at me and be like, that 28 year old kid did all this. You know, because again, I'm, I'm scratching that itch. Right. That, and I'm chasing that acclaim. That was. What, and what was it for you, if you're honest deep down, was it a desire? And what I found in life, maybe you relate with this, is that there's, it's not always all evil or no. all good. There's always competing desires and they can coexist, mutually coexist at the same time. There could be a, a holy, a holy prompting for something from God that gets intertwined with a fleshly something, right? A mm -hmm. godly motive and a selfish motive. So obviously part of it is godly. Yeah. I mean that that desire to reach people is godly, but then when you, when we allow the flesh side, so, but for you on the, fl on the fleshy, what would be called sinful side, was it just like a desire for significance? Was it a, des a desire for fame? Was it just like the, the adrenaline? Like, what was it that, that was driving you, um, to, for the success? If what was driving you was not good. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was all of the above. All of it. It yeah. was probably those two things. It was probably fame and significance. significance. And the significance is more healthy, right? Because it's like, okay, I want to do something good in the world. But there was a lot of fame there too. Okay. Like I wanted to be on the camera. I wanted to be the one that saved these boys. And the ironic part about it is by me doing that, I actually <laughs> didn't attune to what the boys needed. I attuned to what the cameras wanted to see. Mm. And I, I, like, I, I could have never said this years ago. I'm sure I stirred up so much conflict on that ranch and hurt those boys in so many different ways because of my desire to be seen and my pride. And really the root of pride is fear. I think, hmm. you know, like if, if the root of all sin is pride, maybe like one layer deeper might be fear. Um, and for, for me, I was very fearful huh. of, uh, not being somebody, not, not, um, not living up to the standard of what Annie's grandpa just did, which was give a million bucks towards this thing and thinking I'm this guy. And it was a lot probably internally too, like me needing to drive this thing forward. And the, the, I mean the, the, the sh short story of it is, um, eventually like we're going out to these streaming platforms and we had trackers and all the links, nobody's watching it, but we're getting turned down. Like, so no one's watching it and we're starting to get turned down and we're like, the agents are like, we don't know what's happening. We've never seen this before. And eventually the Lord gives my wife a vision of chasing wild in a tomb. I don't even know what that would look like. I wake up to a dream and I'm not at this point in my life. I'm not a very prophetic type dude. Mm -hmm. Like I was still kind of like on like the more reformed. Like <laughs> I don't really know about all of that. Like okay. that stuff's kind of weird to me, but I get this dream. I can't deny the dream chasing wild in a coffin. My, um, she gets a vision. She gets of a vision. Chasing Wild, which is the name of the series. Yes. In a tomb. Yes. And you get a dream of it in a coffin. Yeah. Okay. I get a call from the producer who came to know the Lord through Chasing Wild. Uh, she she calls me and she goes, "Hey, I've been really hesitating to say this to you, but the last week the Lord's been telling me that Chasing Wild needs to die. <sighs> this thing is full on idol in my life. This thing, like, I, I remember literally telling my mentor, this sounds horrible to say. Like, even the other day, I was telling my wife this, and she's like, "Wow, that's that's pretty bad." Um, I I told my mentor if Chasing Wild reaches ten million people and my intimacy with christ decreases by 50 percent. i take the 10 million <gasps> you actually said that i legitimately said that i confessed that to my mentor and it wasn't like i was proud of it i was confessing a sin i see but that's where i was at that's where you're at i was literally like this thing wow. has to go this thing has to because all these people are counting on me and now okay so so you're saying if you're if you're being honest Definitely part of it was your ambition and your desire for success. But there's also part of it where it's like <clears throat> a, just a responsibility of this guy's money and these guys' expectations. And so I'm willing to lay down something for me because I need this to succeed. Yeah. Because I, I want it to I want to be famous too, but for the the pressure of all these other people as well. Yeah. It was both. Okay. It's both. Okay. Yeah. It was all the above. So now there's these three basic words from the Lord that are all confirming with each other. And so what did you guys do? Well, I, I kind of, I, I didn't tell her about the words. This is how, how in deep I was. I literally on the phone didn't go, oh, well, I had a dream and Annie had a vision. I didn't tell her that. Oh. I couldn't because I didn't want, I didn't want to do what the Lord wanted us to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to do it. So, so what I did instead is I played the money game. I go, Allison, I don't know what that means, 
we have a loan to the tune of a quarter of a million dollars to a foundation. Still outstanding. How am I going to pay a quarter of a million dollars? So like you tell me because she and then she kept going, well, I think it needs to die in your heart. I'm like, okay, great. It's dead in my heart. What do I do about the money? Like, what is that? What does that mean? She calls me later that afternoon. She goes, Ryan, the, the tax grant from the state of Alabama where we did all the editing, all post-production um, and states will like pay, you know, like a fraction of a dollar for every dollar you spend in their state if you do like film work there. And she's like, the, the state grant, this incentive from the state of Alabama came back $253,000. So now I'm like, shoot, man. <laughs> No more excuses. This thing has yeah. to die. So I wish I could tell you right now that Chasing Wild is out and it's great. I have a $3 million project still sitting in a hard drive waiting on the Lord. And I don't know what he's going to do with it. And if I'm being honest, there's still probably a little bit of idol left in me as we speak. Um, mm. And I started this like side project of Share the Struggle where it's like basically this all-in-one mental health platform. Because I thought it was a good idea. Honestly, but I'm like, I'm going to pass that off. And how the Lord started blessing that. And I think it's because my heart's not in it. Like it's not an idol for me. Mm. And so that's kind of what I do now. I've got my idol sitting in a hard drive. And the Lord's like, we'll just keep that on ice until you're ready. Or maybe he just kills it. Maybe it never sees the light of day. Which I don't think so because I think the Lord always kills something to resurrect it. Mm. Um, and in his timing. Yeah. And because there's a message of hope in it for other people. Totally. It just needs to not be... What he doesn't want it to be for you. Yeah. And, and, and see, this is what's so, what I have such a hard time understanding with the Lord is that he will literally spend $3 million to help four boys. And he will literally spend $3 million to get my heart meek. Hmm. Cause that's the word he started whispering to me. He started whispering this word meekness. Um, and I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm at this point I'm trying to write a book. Which, because because the distribution guy was like, you should write a book with this. It'll be really good. At this point, as in right now. No, or I'm back sorry. With, this back was with, during this process. During this the, process, the, the, when it when Chasing Wild was supposed to be something big, this guy was like, you need to write this book. Okay. And everyone's in my ear. I've now got a, I've got like a top book agent, and I've uh, I've got like marketing people saying this is what the book should be about. This is what the book should be about. You know, it should be about the boy crisis in America. It should be about what happened to you on the ranch. Um, it should be about why young people are leaving the church. And the whole time I'm thinking like, I've lost this book now. Like, I don't know what this book's about. All these marketing people are just telling me what I'm supposed to write. I'm like this 29 year old kid. Like, I don't, well, I shouldn't even be writing a book in the first place. Like, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. And so I just, I just shut my laptop and I said, Lord, I'm not picking that back up till you tell me what it's about. And he started whispering that word meekness to me, mm. which I thought was about the book. And I'm like, man, that's so boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah number like, one bestseller meekness right so um but the more i started hearing it it was undeniable it was the lord hmm. it was like when you just hear something over and over again it's like okay right. that's jesus and He's so like i'm gonna keep saying it until you listen honestly bro right. and so i just looked it up and the, the greek word is praus mm -hmm. and um i'm sitting on my couch i'll never forget it annie's upstairs my wife and i pull up this article that's like the greek word praus and it said something about Mustangs. So I'm like, what? And so I like look up this article and right there, the, the definition, praus, to tame a wild Mustang. No. The word for meekness meant to tame a wild Mustang. So when Jesus says the meek will inherit the earth, he's not saying meek is a mouse. He's saying meek is a Mustang. And so then the Lord took me on a journey for the next two years to understand what that word really meant. Because people think meekness means weakness. Right. They think, you know, meek is a mouse. Right. And... Nothing could be further from the truth. Right. So what meekness is, it's an adjective. It's describing um, a state that a person's in. Um, and I have now gone through this whole process. I've filmed 128 terabytes of footage of wild Mustang training. I know this thing like the back of my hand. I've done it myself. I've gotten in a round pen with a wild Mustang. And the way you tame this wild Mustang, the way you make it meek, is you've got this prey animal. They've got eyes on the side of their head scanning for predators. We're predators. So instinctually it knows when you walk into a round pen with it, it's now trapped with a predator. And it goes buck wild. So this oh, thing starts kicking. That's bucking. why they freak out. Okay. That's why they freak out. And again, the, the federal government. Has that's where the term buck wild comes from, huh? Yeah. yeah. Just, put that to, just put that together. Yeah, man. Okay. <laughs> so, so the government has now rounded up about 70,000 wild Mustangs. They're really? sitting behind bars right now in cages. What? So the federal government has protected wild Mustangs, but they're overpopulating and they're eating all the grazing land. And farmers are like super upset about it. 
And so what's the solution? You don't know what to do with something that's too wild. You cage it. Same exact thing that's happening with young men. <sighs> so that's the whole metaphor. So now I know. Now, now I have a grid, I have a context, I have a category for meekness as I'm now replaying in post-production like, and going through all these clips of meekness playing out and what the first step in how you tame a wild Mustang is called acknowledgement where you get in this round pen, things freaking out and you pursue this wild horse around a round pen and again, it's kicking, bucking, snorting and the moment it stops for a second, maybe it gets tired or maybe it just gets curious and just looks at you you back off. It's called releasing the pressure. You drop your shoulders and you just walk away from it. Because what it wants for you is to get for you to get away from it. So you reward it. And soon it just starts to go, huh, the way I get this thing to do what I want it to do, which is to get away from me, is I just look at it. So it just keeps looking at you over and over again. It's just acknowledging you over and over again. And then slowly what you do is when you release the pressure, you begin to walk away from it. And after about three to four hours of doing this, this wild Mustang goes from running away from you to following you around this round pen. What? And it's Romans 2, 4. It's the kindness of the Lord that leads us <laughs> to repentance. So I'm learning the first stage it's in not, meekness yeah. is, is you have to see that God is for you. He's not against you. It's his kindness that's going to lead you into a changed life. And so, again, I have a category for this now. So I'm processing all this. And then once you can get that horse to follow you, then slowly after about a couple weeks, it'll trust you enough to get maybe a couple feet from it. And it'll sniff your hand. And the whole time it's reading you, is this thing for me or is this thing against me? We have a generation of people right now that don't know that God's for them. And God is, is, is graciously pursuing in his kindness mm -hmm. these people. And he's calling the church to do the same thing. And so eventually you can touch this horse. And man, they don't have hands. They've got hooves. They've never felt touch like that before. So when you rub a horse's back, it's like, oh my gosh, what is this? But I love this. Mm. It's never felt that, that kind of feeling before. And so this horse just falls madly in love with you. And this wild horse that's seen as the mud of the horse breed becomes the most valuable horse you can have because it'll run 35 miles into, in, into battle for you and not be phased by the flaming arrow because it's so trusting of you because it's, it's done the work in the round pen. And that's mm. what the Lord had to get me to is, is he had to get me to that place where I was seeing that he was kind, he was for me. And then all the times I would freak out, all the times I would try to go into my autonomy because they're hustling in, in the wilderness, right? They're trying to find food. They're trying to get away from predators. I had to get all of that Egypt out of me. And I had to learn through my wilderness journey of the Lord letting me meander and letting me, you know, be the prideful, fearful guy that I was. He was just wooing my heart the whole time. Hmm. And he was by his kindness drawing me to himself. And then slowly he could put the saddle on my back and he could put the bit in my mouth. Once I was ready. And then once I was ready, he could take me out of the round pen. And then once I was ready, he could lead me into war. Because with one nudge of the reins, I know where he wants to go because I'm that in tune with my master. Hmm. That's meekness. Meekness is not weakness. It's not this, this disposition of like, I'm really calm. Right. That's not meekness. Moses was the meekest man on the planet. He stood in front of Pharaoh. This is like one of the scariest things you can do is go back. So you're talking about this warrior, Moses, this dude who was fearful, but the Lord's making him meek through the process. And he's calling him to go back and free the people. And then Moses, out of his meekness, out of the power of his meekness, led the people out. Hmm. And it was because he trusted his master at that point. Mm -hmm. He had done the work in the round pen. And that's what the Lord had to get me to. And then once all that started happening, you know, I, I had, did I was. You, did you have any ahead. moments where you were just broken in this process? Like emotionally broken? Yeah, I couldn't sleep. I, I was, um, I was so fearful of what people thought of me and, um, there was one time where yeah, take us deep, take us deeper into that because yeah. sometimes it's easy for us to tell the stories, but what people who are listening to this, they're feeling the actual pain that they're feeling. So, and so if you if there were those moments, yeah, what yeah. was what is it like? Take us back to that. There's there's two moments um, that I think are the sweetest moments of my life, but probably some of the most painful <laughs> um, <clears throat> because now I can see that that pain led me into greater meekness because I had to, I had to go back to that high school kid and I had to rely on him because I had nothing. Um, the first was that producer who's now one of my best friends because she met the Lord, um, threatened to take me to court if I didn't give her 50% of the project. And the project wasn't mine. It was a nonprofits that I sat on the board of. And so I started having panic attacks like, Oh my gosh, my baby, this thing, this, you know, big project that we're having all this interest from in Hollywood is now, she's like literally threatening to burn the hard drives. And so I'm waking up with panic attacks for the first time in my life. Um, never had anxiety. 
Hmm. Uh, it's the worst feeling in the world. Yeah. And so that was one. The second one that was continually breaking was about, <laughs> about a month after that when we pulled the project. Um, I had just started Share the Struggle and obviously I needed funding. And um, I go back to Annie's grandpa and I say, hey, would you, would you fund this new project? You know, this mental health platform. It's so needed in the church. I give the whole pitch. I did the whole pitch deck. And he doesn't say a word. And then over the phone, he says, Ryan, you are feeding dog food to dogs that don't like the taste of your dog food. He said, <sighs> you've taken a million dollars of this family's money and done nothing with it. I'm not giving you another dime. And I put the phone on mute and I cried because this is, you know, family. <coughs> and um, at that point, everything had been lost. Like it, it, the project had been now like, you know, it had been long enough to where it had, you know, was collecting dust. Now the family thinks it's a big failure. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm that guy. I'm that guy that everyone looks at and goes, oh man, he, he had it. He was on the one yard line and he couldn't punch it in. And so once I realized that, that I was that guy, I went back to the intimacy with Jesus that I had in high school wow. when I was that little squirrely Jew Frode kid with my backpack walking in, you know, having nothing. And I regained intimacy with Jesus. And I started hearing his voice for the first time in a really long time. And like, like his whispers, he started like whispering things to me in the middle of the night. Like I remember one night he woke me up and all he said was, Martha, Martha, you're worried about many things. <sighs> and I'm like, well, my name's not Martha, but I get the point. Thank yeah. you, Lord. Uh, yeah, you're right. He woke me up another night and he said, Ryan, your, 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 your fear, because I was like now having anxiety attacks. Um, and not saying this is everyone with anxiety, but for me, he said, Ryan, your fear that you're like feeling bad for yourself about is actually pride. And just little things like that in his kindness, he's, I started hearing his voice. And then um, I decided to get on social media and just out of that intimacy started sharing the gospel. Hmm. And, um, and then it was funny, like the thing that I wanted that now was dead, he gave me, you know, like I wanted that platform. And now, you know, this like, cause we've been processed. It's like, if my, if my Instagram got shut down tomorrow, I'd be really sad because not of what yeah. it would do to me, but right. because it would be a lost impact for right. people. And so, um, all that to say, man, like it, that, that suffering, cause it was suffering, um, and not to diminish other people's really gnarly suffering, but in a sense it was suffering. Yeah. It's the greatest gift I could have been given because it, um, it led me back to that high school kid with the backpack. It led me back to meekness. Mm. And then once the Lord was like, all right, buddy, I've seen that I can trust you on a, on a trail ride. You're meek enough. You can go to war and he could, he could use me, um, so I just, I kind of went buck wild with that meekness theme. I started asking everyone I knew, who's the meekest person you know? And can I talk to them? And I'll never forget, I talked to this one guy who's a um, former CIA agent, special forces, then was doing like CIA stuff I've learned is so gnarly. Like they just drop you in a country. They're like, if you die, we don't know you. And so that's, that's what this guy was. Crazy. Yeah. So um, I obviously won't use the guy's name, but um, he was telling me a story because I, he, he, he stopped me when I'm interviewing him. He goes, Ryan, you keep using the word surrender when it comes to meekness. It's like, I think there's a better word. He's like, let me tell you a story. I was, I was training the Taliban back, you know, in the early, uh, yeah, in the early nineties when we were actually on the side of the Taliban, oh, fighting were, the Russians. When yeah. They were good guys. yeah. When they were, when they were the supposed good guys yeah. back in the early nineties. And he's like, these dudes would pop out of a rock and just start like shooting at these Chinook helicopters, like flying above. And I'm like trying to train them. I'm like, get behind a bush, get behind a building, do something but they didn't care. And he said, the Holy Spirit spoke to me in that moment. He said, these Muslim men who, although misguided, right? Not following Jesus, um, getting it wrong. They're more meek than you are because they've fully lost ownership of your life. Have you lost ownership of your life? And he's like, at that moment, I've realized that I was so self-protective. And in a way, again, not defending that these guys are bumping right. off shots, but... Um, they knew where they were going in their minds. They had no fear of death. Like the meekness. And so what he told me is like, you know, I think surrender is a decent word, but I think ownership's a better word. These men had lost ownership of their lives. Their lives were not their own. <sighs> and he's like, which is exactly what Jesus asked of us. It's exactly what he asked of us. And we've got a, a culture and a generation right now that it's such a shame. They don't know the joy of lost ownership of your life. <laughs> and I'm so grateful to the Lord now that that, beautiful 
series that was so near and dear to my heart is sitting in a hard drive collecting dust somewhere because I wouldn't trade it in the world because now I know Jesus deeper than I ever possibly could have if I didn't go through that processing. Wow. Bro, thank you for sharing all that. So just because I'm curious, I know people are going to be curious. This this whole this whole episode is really about what yeah, your struggle and what God's doing in you, but so it is collecting dust. Mhm. There's no plan for it until or if ever God opens up something and makes it clear. Other than that, it will stay. It will stay. Yeah, I'm just waiting on the Lord, waiting on his voice. Wow. Yeah. And, and some people might say, well, that's irresponsible. Trust me. Like, I am such a guy where I'm like, let's just go, let's go, let's push it. Let's bash our head against the wall till it breaks. <laughs> and the Lord is teaching me to just wait because warriors wait. They yeah. wait till the horn blows and then they go to war mm-hmm. and then they come back and they wait and they wait and they train and they wait. So maybe it's misguided, but I don't think so. Cause I've heard clearly from him. If I didn't hear clearly from him, I'd be like, that's come on, bro. Like you need to get after it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, but, but yeah, that's, that's the thing. It's actually one of the essential parts of why we're doing this tour, which is, I think our generation, myself included, has lost a good definition of what success actually is. Yeah. And, you know, we have all these metrics for what we think is successful and whether or not an outcome can be or or is what people think it should be. But I've come to believe that at the foundational level, success in the (coughs) kingdom is doing what God says. Yeah. It's obeying God, no matter what it looks like. Yeah. And it might look like, like, in other words, to just say, well, if you obey God, it, it for sure will always mean it looks like success. It's not, it's just not the point. The yeah. point is not the outcome. The point is obeying him whatever whatever he wants. Yeah. And sometimes that will look like success. Sometimes it will look like failure. But winning in the world's eyes and disobeying God is the biggest failure you can have. Yeah. So, dude, thanks for sharing your story. And I look forward to seeing what takes place or doesn't take place with yeah. all of this. Real quick before I move to the second part of this this uh, series, we just didn't jump too much into it, but just because I have a sense that it's going to help people, what exactly is Share the Struggle, <laughs> and how can people find it if it's something that will be, be, be beneficial to their life? Dude, I really think it will be. Um, I didn't know what we were building. And like I said, like my identity totally wasn't in it. I thought it was like the B team. Yeah. And now the Lord's kind of revealing, wow, I think you got something here. So basically what we created um, was Masterclass meets Celebrate Recovery meets Alpha, if you know the Alpha mm-hmm, course, mm-hmm. but for struggles. So we we just gathered all the world-leading experts on anxiety, trauma, miscarriage. So people like Dr. Caroline Leaf, Rebecca Lyons, Matthias Barker, who's our other TikTok buddy. Yeah, um, he's from my neck of the woods. Yeah, yeah, now he's in Nashville, but... Yeah, but he came from Spokane, I think. Yeah, and and so wow, so like just in line with literally what this podcast is about is totally. talking about the struggle, the pain, the brokenness. Totally. So what do you guys? So so this is all a digital platform that are that you can anybody yeah. can tap into from anywhere. So we do two things: we do content. So we have, like I said, we have courses on how to deal with all these things, and then we have training. Like, what do you do when someone's having a panic attack? What do you do when someone says, "Hey, I'm thinking about killing myself"? So we have training on all of that. What do you do when your wife has a miscarriage? How do you help her through that? Um, and extensive courses, like very, very highly produced wow. with amazing people. So that's the first thing we have content. And then we have audio meditations, uh, prayers, scripture meditations, uh, breathing, inner healing prayer type stuff. Like we've really gone deep into wow. content. I honestly think this isn't a brag. I think it's just a reality. I think we have the most robust mental health Christian platform on the planet in terms of like video content. Really? And we just launched. So no one really, well, I shouldn't say no one really knows about us. Church of the Highlands just rolled it out. Um, North Coast Church here in San Diego is rolling it out. And then we we started gathering who I believe are the top Christian experts that are like spirit-filled, prayerful, mental health professionals. And basically saying, hey, we have a model that's a coaching model um, where you'll meet with someone over Zoom and you'll do coaching with them. And basically it's like mental health coaching. So if you have anxiety, we have, a, we have the best, I think, in the world, <laughs> like who are Christians, who are going to meet with you, who are going to talk you through that. They might send you down, you know, through a course, or they're just going to like give you principles and practices. Wow. Um, and so we just have a, a coaching platform and that's, that's like taking off right so now. So how do people find it? If you go to sharethestruggle.org, 
um, you can see all of our content and okay. all of our coaching, or you can go to share the struggle org slash coaching. Um, and that's, it's just really cool, man. It's, it's, that's uh, amazing. yeah, we're seeing God do some pretty crazy stuff. Like the stories I'm, I'm having these, you know, therapists and stuff like text me every day and just be like, you're not going to believe what just happened on my call. And of course they don't, they're not giving names or anything, yeah. but they're just like, this person was really struggling with this. And then the Holy Spirit just showed up. Boom. So it's, it's pretty sweet. Um, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing all that. Conversations in contrast is about two primary things. One, what is something difficult or one of the hardest things you've been through in your life? And then the second, we always like to end these these episodes on just talking about something awesome. Mm. So I don't know how much you know, but I was trying to do some research behind your back to ask some people about what is just something amazing and awesome about Ryan. Mm. What's something that he does that maybe... <coughs> You know, he's not putting it in a video or people might not know about him. Maybe it would sound like bragging if he talked about it, but it's just straight up awesome. Hmm. So don't be humble about this. We want to hear. This is cool. So I actually heard a number of different things that I could talk to you about. <laughs> <laughs> There's multiple awesomenesses to you. But one thing stood out to me, and we haven't talked about it yet with any of the other guests, something like this. And so I want to hear about this. I think your wife told me, that you do something special every Monday mm. with your son. Yeah. And it's called something and you guys go and do something. And so what is that? Tell us about it. What is it and why? So it's called special morning. Special it's, morning. It's called special morning. And that's my dad actually coined the term. Okay. So my dad would take me and my brothers to get donuts every Monday morning and we'd read the Proverbs. And so... With my son, my son's three. Okay. He's about to turn four. Okay. And so I take him to get donuts every Monday morning. Every single Monday? Uh, unless we got something yeah, going on. Yeah, yeah. But, okay. Um, it's, a yeah standing, it's a standing date. Yep. Okay. And we memorize scripture. And so my son, <laughs> who's three, knows probably a dozen scriptures at this point. Really? Yeah. And he'll rattle them off. Is it always Proverbs then for you guys? Or no. did you expand it? You just, I'm, we're doing donuts, date with dad, donuts, and scripture. Something. Yes. Yes. Every totally. Monday. Yep. And then, and then, um, most mornings he wants to watch like Paw Patrol or something. Um, but he has to earn it. And so we do push ups and he has to recite a Bible verse. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I love this. Yeah. That is just awesome. Yeah. That's it, just straight up. And we do it together. Yeah. So, so when he does the push ups, you'll do the push ups? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then you guys are memorizing the verses together? Yep. Dude, he's three. He's three. That's crazy. Yeah. Okay. Well, I love that. Yeah. I absolutely love that. Let me ask about one more thing then since I was short. Sure. And you alluded to this when you were talking earlier, and I think that sh your wife also said something about this. Do you go on prayer hikes? Yeah. Okay, so so um, I've noticed a significant difference in my content on social media if I'm communing with the Lord before I communicate to my phone. Commune before communicate. And that's actually a prophetic word that my mentor gave me mm -hmm. is he's like, Ryan, you're communicating all this stuff, but like how deep are you going yourself? Yeah. And so <clears throat> that's exactly why, like I have a little thing hanging down here that says pray first. Yeah. 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 Cause yeah. you can get in the habit of making stuff for God, for people, but not actually having it come from the source of. Yeah. Totally. Okay. And social media is really dangerous Yeah, because of the dopamine hits of like, oh, that went viral. I know what goes viral now. If I talk about porn or if I talk about hell, it's going to go viral. But is that what the Lord's asking me to do? Right. Sometimes, maybe. You know, but but I but think... But I'm not just going to do that because I know that it's going to, yeah. Yeah, and I'm not just making content for other people. I'm making it for me. And so I've noticed when I spend time with Jesus, when I'm like actually communing with him, when I'm crying on hikes, sometimes I'll start dancing on these hikes and p I'm sure people look at me like I've got three heads, but I'll, I'll just get in, you know, worship and I'll start dancing and crying. And then all of a sudden when, when I make content after that, I'm saying what the Lord wanted me to say because I mm. communed with him first. I got mm -hmm. filled up. I was abiding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I'm able to share what's out of his heart and whether it goes viral or not, um, who cares? Yeah. I just, I just, Cause you did it for the right reason. I, yeah. And I, I did it with the Lord. Yeah. So from, the, from the overflow of what he's doing to you. Yeah. And if I don't do that, if I go and there's many weeks I go without it and I just get in this busy cycle, um, I, I can see it in the content and I can see it in my joy and in my burnout. Um, I can turn into a worker for the Lord instead of a lover of the Lord. Right. And when you're a lover of the Lord, you're actually a better worker for the Lord because you're abiding. Right. Man, so good. I love that. So if you have kids, consider, what's it called? Special, a special, special morning. Special yeah. morning or evening or whatever. Yeah. 
Memorized, man, that's beautiful. Thanks, cool, man. man. Well, um, is there is there any other place that that people could find you? Are all your are you have different handles online? Dude with good news. Yeah, that's about it. Or I you mean, could search Ryan Miller. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then share the struggle dot org. Yeah, yeah, anything and I else, um, anything else you want to share plug? Um, not really, man. I think just if if you're struggling out there, uh, know that you're not alone. Mm-hmm. That that Jesus actually meets us in the middle of our deepest pain points, in the middle of our struggle, and that's like the most beautiful place you can be. In some senses, it's painful, it's hard, it's difficult, um, it's not fun, but. God says that his power is made perfect in our weakness. Mm -hmm. He says that he's a great physician. He's a wonderful counselor. He's the prince of peace. And so no matter what you're going through, he's in that with you. And you can go get help. There's, like I said, I built this whole platform because I think the Lord just teed it up. And we've got some of the most spirit-filled, amazing counselors and coaches that would love to meet with you. And again, that's at sharethestruggle.org. Perfect. Or there's just a link in my bio on all my pages. Awesome. Well, to that end, um, you were just looking right at the camera talking to them. Why don't you say a prayer? in closing yeah. towards any area of your pain that people that are resonating <coughs> with this and whatever just God leads you in that. Yeah. Yeah. Father, I just thank you so much that you identify yourself as a father. I just pray for anyone that's listening to this right now that doesn't maybe understand all that that means. Mm-hmm. I just pray Holy spirit that you would illuminate their mind to your love that you would flood their bodies right now in Jesus name with peace that they would know that there's neither height nor depth nor angels nor rulers nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor anything else in all of creation that can separate them from the love of Christ that's found in you and in your death and resurrection, Lord. And you gave us the right to become children of God Mm. because of that death and resurrection. So I just bless you as you're watching this in Jesus' name um, with a greater understanding of the Father's heart for you. Thank you so much for, for Craig. Lord, thank you for his obedience. Thank you for our friendship. Um, I just love this guy so much. And I just pray you bless this podcast, Lord. Um, I pray that he would experience joy and even editing as he's heading home um, right now. Keep keep his family safe. We just love you so much, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, bro. And God bless you all. We'll see you next time.